theyeshiva.net. Let's continue inside. We're holding the Maimer Hasam Nafshenu Bachayim Velenosim Amait Raglenu that was said Shabbos Kairach Gimel Tamos Tov Shin Yud Ches 1958. And we're up to Siv Ches, close to the end and the conclusion of the Maimer. After explaining at length everything that was addressed in the beginning of the Maimer, and the key issue is understanding what Kairach's mistake was. And it has to do with the understanding of what happened on the first Monday of creation. The Noyem Elimelech connects the two components. Oh, thank you. On the first Monday of creation, Yihirakiya Mavdul Bein Mayim Lamayim with Yeribayin Shalolam separates the higher water from the, uh, uh, from the lower water. And then on Tuesday, there is a second Kitoiv, one for the water and one for the Tuesday work. And the question is, if Monday is so bad as the Medrash says Machlaikas was created, why does it get a Kitoiv later? And the explanation we explained was that the Monday separation is the general concept that in our fabric, in the fabric of creation, there is a dichotomy, there is a split between the higher self and the lower self, between the higher water and the lower water, between pleasure, which is defined in terms of harmony with truth and the divine, versus pleasure that is divorced from that. And that separation happened on Monday. That's the essence of the separation of Mayim al Yayna, Mayim Tachtayna. Mayim al Yayna represents the pleasure that's associated with heaven, meaning the pleasure that is associated with oneness, with infinity, with the source of all pleasure. But there's another form of pleasure it's the lower water, and it's the difference of Chesed and Gvura. Chesed represents revelation, expression, Gvura always represents withdrawal concealment. Whenever you create boundaries and restrictions, you're basically withdrawn and your benevolence is concealed because you're actually giving space for the other. So chesed and gvura are two very different midas. Monday is the day of gvura, the second day, and that's when there's the separation between the mayim al and the mayim tachtoinim. The purpose of the separation was to create a deeper yearning a deeper thirst in the Mayim Tachtoinim, as Chazal tells us, the Zoyar says, Mayim Tachtoinim boichim, anan be'inin lemeve kadamalke. The Mayim Tachtoinim weep, we want to stand before the king. And that p'chia, that sense of yearning, of pining, of, of longing, is actually what gives the Mayim Tachtoinim a luster, and a flavor, and a depth, to the point that their aliyah, their sublimation is even deeper than they were before the separation of the Mayim Achtachtoinim from the Mayim al And that's what Tuesday brings out. Tuesday is the day when the earth became conducive as a habitat for the humanity, because we, can't, we cannot live in water. We only can live on dry land. And therefore, Tuesday begins the potential for the avoid of a person, which will ultimately fix the dichotomy between the Mayim al and the Mayim Achtachtoinim. Kairach's mistake, Kairach, is of the opinion that no, the purpose of the separation was for the separation itself. Kairach believes that since in Gashmias you have something that doesn't exist in Ruchnias, the Sheirish Gashmias is deeper than the Sheirish Ruchnias, so therefore the Mayim Tachtainim, in a way, are deeper than the Mayim al and that's the purpose of the separation, because the physicality itself has something that spirituality doesn't have. And we explained at length that Kairach believed that the tzimtzum is deeper than the gilui. In other words, in the darkness that's manifested in this world in the absence, you have everything. You have the essence, even though it's not revealed. In Revelation, you only, only have a limited expression. So therefore, Kairach, worship, so to speak, the tzimtzum, the darkness of this world, the physicality of it. And therefore, Kairach says that the machlaikas of Monday is in and of itself good because it allows for the creation of the Gashmi, which is separate from the Ruchni. Or in other words, that Gvura becomes more powerful than Chesed because Gvura is concealment and Chesed is expression. His mistake is... This is true when Mashiach comes, this, the, the truth of the Gashmi will be revealed. 
But in order to get there first, the physical must be aligned with the spiritual. The body has to be aligned with the soul. The gvura has to be subservient to the chesed. The lower water has to cry about its separation from the higher water. Kairach did not realize, or his mistake was, that when you prematurely elevate the Gashmi above the Ruchini, what happens is you can get caught into the external trap of it. And not only will you not be elevated by it, but on the contrary, you will be degraded. This is basically the discussion that we explored. And the reason Kairach had a problem with this was because he was missing the concept that we spoke about, Bittl, the ability to understand the paradox of life. So either you go to one extreme or you go to the other extreme. And that's where the Gemara says, Ein machzikin b'machleikas. You don't hold on to the machleikas. Machzikin. The fact that there is machleikas, there is a split, that comes from Hashem. That happened on Monday. Kairach, what he wanted was, he wanted to be machzik b'machleikas. He wanted to hold on to that division. The dichotomy itself became something not only important, but worthwhile to hold on to, to maintain. This is where Kairach's error was. What, is, what does all of this mean in a person's life? There is the avoid of b'chod rechecha da'ehu, and there is the avoid of terah mitzvahs. In many ways, the avoid of b'chod rechecha da'ehu has even an advantage over the avoid of terah mitzvahs because it's discovering God in the world. But in order that the avoid of b'chod rechecha da'ehu should not cause the person to become detached from who he or she really is and from who the world really is, on the contrary, they should become a tool to be able to see divine providence, to be able to see Ashgach HaPratis. So this is only when the person has the Mayim Tachtoinim Boichim Anan Bin Elamevi Kadamalka. I'm involved in the world as much as I have to be involved in the world, but my longing, my, my pining becomes to go to the world of Kedusha, to go to the world of Torah and Mitzvahs. Then, you could see in the world godliness, the Eyu. But if not, if I accept the Kairach's philosophy, then from Bechol Rechecha, the Eyu, what can often happen is I lose touch with the truth and the pnimius of the Gashmi, and the darkness just becomes a tool that really takes me away from who I really am and from my connection with the truth of the Gashmi, with the depth of it, with the divine. Let's see further Sif Ches. I know this is a little ambiguous for those who are joining us for the first time, so I'm going to ask you to review the shiurim that we had the beginning of this week and the previous week. I think we had four classes, three or four classes on this mimer, and I think it'll become much clearer. Let's go further, Sivches. Now we'll understand the deeper meaning of this verse in Tehillim, with which the mimer begat. David HaMelech in Tehillim, Kapitel Samach Vav. Thanks, Hashem that you have placed our soul in life and you did not allow our legs to falter. And as he discussed in the beginning of the Maimer, that there is a Maimer from the Rebbe Rayatz for his own Chag HaGaula Yud Beis Tammuz, which is actually this Shabbos. And uh, it's from the year Tofresh Tzadik Dalet, 1934. And there he says that the soul on its own is alive. We don't say Hashem placed us in a place of life. Hasam nafsheinu But the soul itself is alive. A soul is alive. This means that Hasam Nafshenu Bachayim means he placed his soul in a life that is even greater than the life of the soul itself. Because the life of the soul is limited, even though the soul is essentially alive. But nonetheless, it's because of the nature that Hashem imbued in the soul. It's a source of life. So therefore, ultimately, it's limited. And Hasam Nafshenu Bachayim is in a life that is beyond nature. And only then can you have a that the legs will not falter. What is the meaning of this? And to understand the connection with Yud Beis Tammuz and his own Geul Yud Beis Tammuz is the day that the Rebbe Rayatz, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rebbe's father-in-law, Rebbe Yosef Yitzchok, was emancipated from a communist prison and exile in 1927. It's an incredible story that has been recorded already also in history and in books. But in 1927, the Yevsekzia imprisoned him with his with charges for being for being involved in counter-revolutionary work, counter-revolutia. 
Kunta Revolution, Neda Arbet, as it was called, work that was, you know, f- in battle with the with the communist regime because the the Rebbe was remained alone, almost alone in the Soviet Union, you know, an empire of, of close to two hundred million people, and he built an incredible network, underground network of Yiddishkeit, and they sentenced him to death to be shot, which was then commuted to exile for ten years in the Gulag which was then commuted to exile for three years. And on Gimel Tammuz, he was taken out of Spalerka prison and sent to exile Kastrama. But 10 days later, Yud Beis and Yud Gimel Tammuz, he was actually freed in 1927. This was an incredible, incredible moment in Russian Jewish history, which really gave the Jewish people all over the country a, a new lease on life and on pride and dedication. And it planted the seeds for the underground Yiddishkeit in the Soviet Union that continued till 1990 when communism fell. So Yud Beis Tammuz is always celebrated as the Chag Agul of the Rebbe Rayatz in 1927. Yud Beis Tammuz and Yud Gimel Tammuz. Yud Beis Tammuz, he was given permission to go, but the offices were closed, so he went out the next day. Yud Gimel Tammuz. So one of the Maimarim, he said, in 1934 was a son of What's the connection with Yud Beis Tammuz? This is all what he addressed in the opening of the Maim, and he went off to Kairach. Now we come back. He says like this. When a person is immersed in Torah, or immersed in mitzvahs, this is a state of Rosh. Rosh means the head. Now the person is involved in things that are called Rosh. The superior spiritual elements, the purpose of life. When a person is immersed in worldly matters, then the person is in a state of regal. Regal is the legs which are in the bottom of the body. So there's a hierarchy. There's something called Kedusham involved in Torah, involved in mitzvahs, and then there's I'm involved in the world. Just like a person's head never gets dirty. The legs, on the contrary, the feet walk on the ground. So we have sneakers, we have shoes, we have socks to protect us from the hard surface, to protect us from rain, from snow, from gravel, from dirt, from filth, from pebbles, etc. But the reglayim need protection because they come in contact with the physical crust of the earth. That's why we wear socks. That's why we wear shoes. Or in quarantine, I guess, I don't know how many people are wearing shoes, but they're wearing uh, Crocs or slippers, whatever it is. But you're wearing something to protect your aglaim, and when you go out of the house, you need a good protection. The roish, on the contrary, the head, is on top. It doesn't touch the physical crust of the earth. So that's why it's a metaphor. Roish represents the person's involvement in transcendence. Regal represents the person's involvement in the world. The ability... That that my legs should not falter, meaning that despite whatever I'm involved in and despite whatever I'm going through, I should not falter, I should remain connected, I should remain focused. That only comes when Asam Nafsheno Bachayim, when the soul, even though the soul on its own is light, is alive. As we said in the beginning of the Maimir, it's a chai be'etzim. It's not just chai lahachiyos, it's a chai be'etzim nonetheless. The soul itself needs to be placed into a life that is beyond the life of the soul itself. Meaning, What was Kairach's mistake? Kairach was saying very deep stuff. Kairach was saying, as we learned before, that the Shairish of Gashmi is higher than the Shairish of Ruchni. Kairach was saying 
that the objective in Tzimtzum is the Tzimtzum itself, is the concealment itself. His mistake was that when Kairach follows his philosophy, not only do you not get to see the core and the truth of the Gashmi, is on the contrary. You get stuck in it. You get trapped into it. And you could fall down very heavily through it. So that's the connection to this Pasuk. What allows that I could be completely immersed in the world and yet I remain connected. My legs don't falter. I fall. For this you need Hasam Nafsheinu Bachai. You need to connect your nefesh to a place of chayim, of life, which is even beyond your nefesh. Because if you only have the life of the soul itself, it could be that the person will seek to find the godliness in the world itself. And then, when that happens, what's missing is the l'shem shamayim. I want the mayim el I want the toyin, I want the mitzvahs. Then, your legs can falter, meaning my involvement in all of the material aspects of life can cause me to falter. As explained above, in order that in other words, I could be involved in the world as much as I'm supposed to be or I need, but it should always have the consciousness of l'shem shamayim, for the sake of heaven, pun intended, mayim el yoinim, mayim tachtoinim, boichin. For this, the person needs to connect to that which is beyond a definition and a description, a limitation. Over there, the two opposites of chesed and gvur could come together. We spoke about the paradox. When a person doesn't have that bitl, like kairach lacked, so then it's one of two things. Either I say, mayim al is the purpose, and if mayim al is the purpose, chesed is the purpose, let me just go there. Or mayim tachtoinim is the purpose. And let me just go there. Either chesed becomes the purpose or gvura becomes the purpose. The ability to be able to live in that space of paradox, in that space of opposites, to be able to really appreciate the fact that not to feel guilty about the moment, not to feel guilty about the mission of the moment, to be able to look what is the godly purpose of this moment right now is the ability to embrace paradox. And that takes a very deep sense of bittal. It's not about me. It's about being a conduit to fulfill the divine purpose of this moment. Then chesed and gvura come together through the quality of tiferes, but that concept Kairach could not understand. Either go to Mayim al I'm fine. You want to live in the spiritual worlds, live in the spiritual worlds. Or go to Mayim Tachtoinim. That's what he argued. Go into Mayim Tachtoinim. To be able to say, I live in the space which constantly connects both. That requires a sense of oneness with divinity, with godliness that's not defined by one form or another form. It doesn't have forms. On one hand, you're glorifying Mayim Tachtoinim. But on the other hand, Mayim Elioinim. On the other hand, you're living in Mayim Tachtoinim. That ability to be able to navigate and synthesize comes from a very deep humility, which allows you to connect to the world of paradoxes without the need to become fixed and stuck in one format of Avaidus Hashem or another format of Avaidus Hashem. What is Avaidus Hashem? Avaidus Hashem is what is needed at this moment. Sometimes it looks like Mayim El Sometimes it looks like Mayim Tachtoinim. Sometimes it looks very high. Sometimes it looks very low. And in the Mayim Tachtoinim, I don't get stuck. And in the Mayim El I don't get stuck. I don't get stuck with the need for transcendence and absolute spirituality because sometimes my mission and my purpose is to deal with the lower water. On the other hand, in the lower water, I could feel the longing, the yearning for the Mayim El In other words, even in the Mayim Tachtoinim, I'm still connected to another space. How does that work? Where are you? And the answer is, where am I? I am aligned with the undefined reality of Hashem, and therefore I do not need to get stuck in the trap of one form or another form, which is chesed or gvura. This is what we call tiferes, the kavem tzai, which synthesizes both, 
But for this, a person needs the bittel. So even though I know the tremendous advantage in divri harishus, in the involvement in the world, or in the use spiritual language, I know the power of tzimtzum. Nonetheless, I can look at the tzimtzum and say, it's bishvil hagilui, because I want revelation, because I want teirah mitzvahs. Ma'im tachtoinim boichim, anam be'ina lamevi kadamalk. V'yeshloim arshazo ha'kesher, tes v'yeshloim arshazo ha'kesher, this is the connection of this posik with the redemption of Yud Beis Tamas. As we said, the Rebbe Rayatz, the Bala Gaul of Yud Beis Tamas, said this Maimah for Yud Beis Tamas. The Hini Yadu, what's known, Shaydei Hanhagas Hateva, Shi Tamid Baif and Aleph, Echad, Mizgala, Inyan Delay Shanisi. Ela Shayin Delay Shanisi, Mishnah Mizgala, Banhaga Tivis, Humalubish Bak Bala Sateva. The world operates on two states. There's what we call Teva, nature. The sun rises and the sun sets. The moon rises and the moon sets. There are the cycles of creation. There's the cycles of the seasons. There's Anagasa Teva. There's a way, what we call laws of nature. And the laws of nature are incredibly and inexplicably rational. Meaning, there's systems, there's order, there's patterns, and the scientist expects that these laws of nature are going to be universal. These laws of nature can really teach us about our world. In fact, all of human progress in terms of technology, in terms of science, in terms of physics, in terms of engineering on all fronts, engineering of the own human body, our progress in medicine, biology, and engineering in the world outside of, outside of us are all based because we re- come to rely on the systems of nature. We come to rely on the laws of how gravity functions, how matter functions, how energy functions, how solids function, how liquids function. And we come to predict them and therefore create patterns that we could rely on. This is called Teva, the laws of nature. Now, this is an incredible phenomenon because why should nature have laws? Why should nature be defined by laws? Like, is there somebody (laughs) who's imposing these laws on them? Is somebody who wrote a manual and all of nature says, oops, let's find out what the law is. We're all going to behave according to the laws of nature. And after thousands of years, all of science is based that there are laws to discover. If there was absolute chaos, absolute chaos, you come into a bedroom of your child and there's absolute chaos, what's the order you're going to look at? All you're going to see is chaos. And that's just a bedroom that was left alone for a few days because the entropy principle teaches us that things naturally tend to decompose and to become chaotic. But in our world, we see that there are laws and we try to study those laws and figure out those laws. And each year, we learn more and more and more about the laws of nature. And today, they're searching for the string theory. They're searching for the one final mathematical equation that is responsible for all of the laws of nature, believing that all the laws are derived from one unifying principle, which they call the string theory, searching for the string theory. That's the climax of it all, the crescendo. You know, what is that one? Is there but that belief that there's one unifying law that it includes everything? But where does this come from? Why would we expect that nature should have laws? The answer is we expect it because we see it. Wherever you go, you see it. You see that all the botany in the world, the whole planet, it follows certain laws. We see the cell of the living organism follows laws. The DNA follows laws. There's systems. Everywhere there's systems. And these systems are not simple systems. They are complex with such intricacy and delicacy that it's just to study these systems takes has taken thousands of years and we still have not scratched the surface of what lay in these systems. So, and, and this is a real question. Why does nature have laws? That's how it is. What do you mean that's how it is? <laughs> Why are they all abiding by a law? Like this is some secret document or manual or blueprint 
that they all look at and say, mm, this is how we got to function. Where, what, when? If you're saying, if you believe that it's all a random mistake, just natural selection, and everything is literally an error, just sheer luck that we're here, this is a very important question. How nature developed such laws, and it's not laws in one place. The laws are all interconnected, the whole planet and the universe. That is not just a fascinating phenomenon, but an incredible fascinating phenomenon. And it's not like these laws are some crazy laws. Like the laws usually are, a lot of the laws that we are aware of are like very, very rational. They're, they're, they're thought out. They're thought out both in terms of the law itself and vis-a-vis its connection with other laws to be able to support life on our planet the way we know it and to be able to support the continuous existence of our cosmos. So the Rebbe is teaching us here that Teva itself teaches us a tremendous amount about the Creator. Of course, the answer to all of this is that all of nature is defined and is committed to certain laws because nature is a concept, a reality that was conceived by a creator who intelligently imbued nature with the patterns and systems that we come to call the laws of nature. And the fact that this predictability, he calls it tamid ba'ifen echad, teaches us what we call ani Hashem lo'ishanisi. The Pasuk of Malachi says, I, God, have not changed. That ability to be able to see the continuous the continuous themes and patterns and laws and structures of nature that don't stop, don't cease. This is a manifestation of Ani Hashem Loishanisi, of the divine truth that continues to vibrate through existence as the progenitor, as the creator of the world. The Loishanisi of Hashem that's expressed in nature is the one where Hashem is expressed as a lawmaker, as an engineer, as an architect. That's what we see. We don't see the divine vis-a-vis the infinity of the divine, even though this itself is pretty infinite, but we see the divine in terms of a creator, a writer, a, a composer, an architect, an engineer, an artist. I'm looking outside. I see an artist. I could see an artist. And art has laws. Music has laws. Language has laws. If it wouldn't have laws, then you and I wouldn't be able to understand the same language. Wherever you look in creation, you see a system, you see a structure. You see art, you see architecture, you see not just engineering, but but incredible engineering. Engineering that is is mind-boggling, it's mind-staggering. That's what comes out through nature. But there's another element. There's something called a nace, a miracle. What's a miracle? Miracles also speak God, also reflect God. What do they reflect? They reflect the light of the Ein Sof, which is infinite, that's beyond that which is manifested in the system of the world. So you have the Ein Sof that's expressed through Teva, looking at a cell, looking at an atom, looking at a molecule which is made up from atoms, anything that you look at with a microscope or with your naked eye, with a telescope or with a microscope, will speak volumes about the presence of a creator who is manifested within every element of nature. But then there is what the miracle expresses, and the miracle expresses that which is beyond nature. It defies nature, and therefore it's not limited by the laws of nature. The laws of nature might predict one reality, and the miracle defies that law. So it's two different aspects of Ein Soif that are expressed through Teva and through Nisim, through nature and through miracles. This comes from two midas. One is chesed, one is gvura. Remember, chesed is revelation, expression. Gvura is containment, restrictions. Gvura in our life is discipline. 
Gvur is you communicate with filters in a restricted way, in a focused way, in a limited way. Teva is always defined by limits. Space, time, category, tzimtzum. There is laws of nature and they're fixed and they're predictable. That comes from Gvura. Chesed is the expression of infinity and therefore everything is part of infinity and there's no fixed laws. Miracles are a reflection of Chesed. Teva is a reflection of Gvura. We learned before that Gvura has something that's deeper than Chesed. You remember we learned before that the Shoyrish of Gvura, the source of Gvura, is really deeper than the source of Chesed. Why? Because whenever there's revelation, it's always limited based on how much is being revealed, how much could be revealed. Whenever there's the absence of revelation, you have there the full essence, always the full essence in the absence of revelation. In revelation, it's always, if I'm expressing myself, it's what I'm expressing of myself, how much I'm expressing of myself, how much you can see that, how much you can experience. When I'm not expressing myself, in the sound of silence, in the sound of the absence, you have the whole atmos, you have the whole essence. So Gvura has in it a depth that's deeper than Chesed. That's why he says in Teva, there's something that Nisim don't have. The Loishanisi, the unpredictability, the immutability, the eternity. What we see that it's consistent without any change. Where do you see that? You see that in the laws of nature. There's something in Gvura that you don't even have in Chesed. V'hanisim, gilu shalomayla me'agbala sateva, hei me'achasadim. V'inyin la'achlala smala b'yeminuhu, sh'agilu da'ir insayf ha'blig vol sh'ayde ha'nisim, hu'loi ba'ayfin d'shidu da'teva. Ela da'agam d'shet teva nisha b'metziyusoy, r'ayim b'gilu sh'onei shalomayla me'ateva. Kairach didn't want the left should be subsumed in the right. He wanted there should be a machlaikas. The objective is that the gvore should become subsumed in the chesed. What does that mean? That means that the revelation of chesed bligvul should not only negate nature, but rather nature should be able to remain in its reality and still within teva you should see that it's a miracle that is beyond nature. The Inyan Shittiv by Midas Harachemim, who is Galus Alukusai de Tzadikim Voices of Mavsim, Hakavana Bazei, be Ikeloises of Mavsim Shaide at Tzadikim, Hamulabashim Beteva, Shittiv boy, Sha Oises Van Mavsim Shulamaila Mateva Machasodim, Vateva Shabai Mulabashim of Mavsim, who may have Vurus, Volochain Oises of Mavsim Ele Midas Harachemim Tifedes, Shamechabelish Nehofim the Chesod the Gvur. You have miracles that completely defy nature. You have nature, which is just looks like nature, completely concealing any creator. People could study nature all their life and still, at least in their own mind, justify, justly or unjustly, that they're atheists or they're agnostics and so forth. What is the synthesis of the two? That within nature itself, you should be able to see that there's something that is supernatural. That's where chesed and gvura come together. Not that I have to deny nature and defy nature and break nature. That's obliterating gvura and going to the mayim aliyonim. The ability that in the mayim tachtonim itself, I should be able to experience a nace that's lamayla mehateva. Can I see the ordinary as extraordinary? Can I see the nature as supernatural? That is where the real unity in life comes becomes. It reminds me, there's a beautiful interpretation. We're talking about Noyem Ali Melech here. And I know there's what a Lezhenske Chassid, a very strong Lezhenske Chassid, on the, listening to this year, say, here's another Noyem Ali Melech. A beautiful interpretation. The Noyem Ali Melech says, I think it's a piece of Noyem that was actually written by his son. I don't know if it's Reb Melech itself or his son Reb Eliezer, but it's printed in Noyem Ali Melech either in Parshas B'Shalach or in the back of the Sefer. So he says as follows, by Kriyas Yamsov, the splitting of the sea, the term that's used in Chumash and Parshas B'Shalach is that the Jewish people, they went into the sea, but they went into dry land because the sea split and it became dry land. At the end of the story, the order is reversed, and that's what we say every morning. 
כיווסוס פארי בריך בפרשה ביום וישב על שם על אמס מהם ובני ישראל הלכו ויבושה בסך הים. We say this right before Yishtabach and the Jewish people walked in dry land in the sea. So the Noyim Elimelech asks, in the beginning of the story it says they went betoich hayam by Abosha. At the end of the story the, re- the order is reversed. They went by Abosha betoich hayam. Uvnei Yisrael bo by Abosha betoich hayam. So the Noyim Elimelech explains a beautiful insight. He says, what was the purpose of Kriyas Yamsuf? What was the purpose? The sea split, great. So now the water is uh, separated, segregated. You have two walls, two chaymas, and now we walk through the two partitions. We walk through the hamayim lem chayma meminu You have a fortress of water on the right and on the left, and the Jewish people walk through betoy chayam, but it's bayabasha. Amazing, amazing, amazing. What was the purpose of this? A moment later, as the Jews passed through, the water came back together, the Egyptians drowned, and that's it. The water returned back to its natural order. That's what the Pasuk says at the end. You know what the purpose of Kriyas Yamsuf was? The purpose was not Kriyas Yamsuf. The purpose was that when later they walk on dry land, it should be the same experience like you're walking in water. Because the truth is, I ask you, is walking on dry land a smaller miracle than walking in water? Of course, we take it for granted. We're always walking. But is walking on dry land less than a miracle of walking in water? It's less of a miracle because it's happening for thousands of years. And it's the way it's supposed to be. We take it for granted. The Chacham Tzvi, the famous Chacham Tzvi, Chacham Tzvi, he was the father of Rabbi Yaakov Emden, Rabbi Tzvi Ashkenazi. He writes, the difference of nature and miracles is frequency. That a ness is nature, a teva is the na- na- miracle repeating itself. Imagine the sun would rise, yeah, once in 1500 years. Yeah, would anybody miss a sunrise? Nobody would miss a sunrise. You know, Berch HaSachama, once in 28 years, everybody is up early. The sun rises nebuch every day, so we sleep. We sleep through. David HaMelech says, not me, a ira shachar. I'm going to wake up the dawn. The dawn is not going to wake me up. There's a Jew. His name is Peter Himmelman. Peter Himmelman was a rock star, a very big celebrity in rock music. Came from a Jewish secular family in Minnesota. And in the early 1980s, he started to discover Yiddishkeit, a very deep soul, very spiritual soul. And he started to come to a weekly class that my older brother, Rabbi Simon Jacobson, was giving weekly, still gives Wednesday nights. So Peter started to come to these classes and uh, naturally coming from the world of, uh, of rock and roll and, and you know, all types of experiences that were very, very far from, from Torah and mitzvahs and Jewish life. This is very deep soul. There's also a lot of cynicism about religion, about Judaism, about Jews who are involved with Judaism, a lot of cynicism that really comes from a soul that's longing to find the truth. You know, cynicism is very often the symptom of a soul that doesn't want to get burnt and it wants real emas. So the first class he came to, he was really pounding my brother with questions. So um, (laughs) he saw a picture he saw a picture, or maybe somebody mentioned, somebody mentioned, somebody at the class mentioned the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, or he saw a picture of him maybe on the wall. So he turns to my brother, he wants to chop him. He said, so these, these, these are the tzaddik, this is, this is the tzaddik you believe in, yeah, this is a tzaddik, a righteous man. So he says, so you believe that this man basically could fly, right? He could basically, if he wants, he's walking, and then suddenly like a bird, his hands become wings and his arms become wings and he soars into the heaven. Like that's what you believe, right? Trying to uh, demonstrate the futility and the ridiculousness and the absurdity of what people can be indoctrinated with. Peter told this story to me years later. And he said, my brother looked at him and said, I, I really don't know about this. I don't know if a human being any human being can fly. I don't know, but let me tell you something. For the tzaddik, 
walking on dry land, taking step by step, is as miraculous and as stunning and as elegant and as ecstatic as flying. And Peter told me, I took pause. I took pause. And he remained, he remained. He ultimately uh, became a Balchuva. He married, he built a beautiful family. <clears throat> he married the daughter of uh, Bob Dylan, Peshaleya. They built a beautiful family. But uh, he was once learning Chesidus. So the Chesidus, you have an expression, Atzmus and Giluyim. Atzmus is the essence and Giluyim is the manifestation. So I asked him, how do you translate this? He told me Giluyim is politics and Atzmus is truth. And godliness is also politics. But this is what the Naim Elimelech says. This is what the Naim Elimelech says. The purpose of Kriyas Yamsov was that when you come back to Yabosha, it should be Betaychayam. Waking up in the morning and having the ability to flex your muscles and the ability of your eyes to see the most sophisticated, the most sophisticated camera in the world, the most sophisticated lens in the world pales infinitely in the comparison to the engineering of the one eye and how many thousands and thousands of photoreceptors that work in perfect synchronization. Opening my eyes is not a miracle. Baruch atah And taking a step and picking up my hand and having the ability to communicate to you and you can hear what I'm saying through your ears. The, the ultimate is not they should walk in the water. No. They should walk on dry land, but it should be b'tay chayam. Even when I'm b'yabosh, it should be b'tay chayam. So there's two elements. You have chesed is nisim, the miracles, kriyat yamsuf. You have gvura is teva. But you have the synthesis of chesed and gvura. The synthesis of chesed and gvura is that the ultimate miracle is the miracle that is manifested through the vehicle of nature. Not that nature has to be broken and shattered, which that, that you have to. There were miracles like that where the Rebbeinah Shalom suspends for a moment or a few moments the laws of nature. But there's a deeper ness, and that's the ness that the Teva itself bespeaks the Ein Saif. Nature itself attests to the fact that it's rooted in absolute infinity. Now, there's something in nature that doesn't even exist in Nes. You remember, Gvur is deeper than Chesed. The consistency of nature represents that Ni Hashem, Loi Shanisi, that God is timeless, God is eternal, there's no weakness there, and that's why the ability of nature and the laws of nature to be so consistent represents the Tzolei which the nest doesn't represent. Then there's, of course, the value of the nest, that's the value of Chesed, and then there's the synthesis. There's a beautiful story. The Balatanya and Rabbi Yitzhak of Bardichev became a Chutonim. The grandchild of the Balatanya married the, gra- the granddaughter of the Balatanya, the daughter of the Mittler Rebbe, I think it was, married the grandson of Rabbi Yitzhak of Bardichev. The Chasana was Tovkov Samach Zayin, what would that be? 1807, uh, 7 in June, Parshish Nasai in Zlobin. You ever heard of Zlobin? Zlobin is a city in the Ukraine, and it came to be known by Hasidim as the Zlobin Achasana, the wedding of Zlobin. Zlobin, I believe, is midpoint between Bardichev and Liadi. Rabbi Yitzhak of Bardichev lived in Bardichev in Ukraine. Some of us went there together, and uh, Baal Terebbe lived in Liadi, which is in Belarus. Zlobin, which is a city in the Ukraine, I believe, is midpoint between Bardichev and Liadi, so it made sense to make the wedding there. So the Yitzhak of Bardichev would come from Bardichev, the Balatanya would come from Liadi, they would converge in Zlobin, and that's where they would marry off their grandchildren. It was a weekend, the Chuppa was on a Friday, obviously they came probably a day or two before, maybe earlier, and they remained over Shabbos. There are many, many Maimorim, many, there are quite a few Maimorim that we have from the Balatanya that he said, at the Chasana and Shabbos and after Shabbos, Parshas Nosei Tovkov Samachzayim. One of the famous Maimarim we learned together in Lekut Teira Shir Hashinim. It begins with the words Keitzad Merak de Lifne Hakala. The argument between Beshame and Beshilo. Some of you remember that Maimar very well because of different reasons. It's an incredible Maimar that was said at that wedding. There's a Maimar. There's a story actually that Maimar the Alter Rebbe finished and he said that uh, he spoke about Sadik Hashem Bechol Drachav Bechosed Bechol Masov. 
So he said, Tzadik Elyon is the Rebbeinu Shalolam, and Tzadik Tachten is Rebbe Levi Yitzchak Badetsheva. <laughs> That's how he finished the Maimer. Tzadik Elyon is Hashem, and Tzadik Tachten, the Tzadik who presents Hashem down here is Rebbe Yitzchak Badetsheva. That's not in the Maimer. I guess the, the writers then, you know, they stuck to the Teichen. So that part is a, is a Messiah, is a tradition. That's how the Alter Rebbe finished the Maimer. We have the Tzadik Hashem, but we don't have the last part, which was really, I guess, the... Uh, an addition to the Maimer. So it's not printed in the Kut, tell you that line, but th- that line is known. It's brought in other transcripts. What I want to share with you is one detail of what happened. The, ch- the chuppah was on Friday. It was often that they would make chuppahs then on Friday. They would get married on Friday, and the meal was Shabbos. Yeah, to anyway have a meal on Shabbos. So there were they, uh, I don't want to say kill two birds with one stone, but the meal of Shabbos, Friday night, was the meal of the wedding. The chuppah was Friday. And the meal was, you can't be Mekadosh on Shabbos. It's a Gzeri de Rabbanon, a Mesech de Beit Salam Advav. You don't do a chuppah, you don't do a Kiddushin, you don't betroth or make a chuppah on Shabbos. There's the one story of the Ramah, but the exception, but that's not for now. But but the, the Sudas of the the Suda of the Chasana was on Shabbos. Anyway, it came to the chuppah. And Ibn Yitzhak of Badichev and the Alter Rebbe were walking together to the Chuppah. And I have to understand, they were very, very close. They weren't just close, they were uh, true, authentic friends. They were both students of the great Magad of Mezrich, although the Badichev was older than the Balatanya. The Alter Rebbe was the youngest student of the Magad. They called him Reb Zalmenu. The Badichev was older. They were very, very close friends. In fact, Yutas Kislev, when the Balatanya came out of prison, in Tovkov Nuntes, 1798, he wrote a letter to report the good news to two people. One was the grandson of the Balshemtiv, the holy Rebbaruchel of Mezhebuz, the Rebbe Rebbaruchel of Mezhebuz, who's a grandson of the Balshemtiv, because the Alter Rebbe was defending the Torah of the Balshemtiv. And the second person was Rebbe Levitzak of Baditchev. He wrote a letter to these two individuals about Hayyim Yayim Psura, Yayim Shlishi Shuchbo by Kitov, talking about Kitov twice, it says Kislev was Tuesday, he mentions that in the letter, Yayim Shlishi Shuchbo by Kitov, Hifli Vihigdil, Lasses, Hashem Ba'aretz, Yisgadol, Vihiskadash, Meirab, beautiful letters to both of these great spiritual giants about his Geula of Yutas Kislev, Tovkov Nuntes, which was also the yard site of the Magad of Mizrich. On the way to the Chuppah, they're walking together, and the door going outdoors where the chuppah was, tachas kippas hashamayim, under the heavens, it was a narrow doorway. So only one person could walk there in one shot. You couldn't have two people go together. So as they're both walking, a little argument ensued who's going to go first. And this is how the story goes. The Badichever wants the Balatanya to go first. The Al-Balatanya says, no, you go first. And his time is, you're older, the Mechutin is older, I have to respect you, and therefore you should go first. The Badichev says that uh, he's not going to go before the Balatanya. Balatanya was uh, uh, the greatest goinim of the generation and of many generations. And he says, Balatanya has to go first. The Balatanya says, no, he wants to go first. And they're arguing about it. He's, he's extolling his praise and he's extolling his praise. They can't come to a conclusion and the Chassid and Kala got to get married, right? So the Badichev tells the Balatanya, and he wasn't joking, by the way. The Badichev tells the Balatanya, I have an idea. Let's go through the wall. Let's go through the wall. So the Balatanya said, name. <laughs> Let the door expand. We're not going to go through the wall. We go through the door. Let the door expand. Hmm. Another version, as he said, we don't have to reveal all the tricks. <laughs> it looks like a very, you know, it's a cute exchange, but it's a very deep exchange. The Yitzhak Abadichev says, it's not just about walking to the chuppah. It's an approach to life. You can't go through the door. You go through the wall. Because there are no real walls. In your perception, there may be walls. You go through the wall. The Alter Rebbe says, no, we don't go through the wall. We go through the door. The door has to expand. That's the idea. We go through the door. In other words, we use the natural means, but we realize that nature itself can become a conduit for that which is beyond nature. The ordinary itself can become extraordinary. I hope you get this. So it says in Tanya, in Shara Yichud Vamuna Perekei, the Gemara says, Chazal say, the Medrash says, Bereish is bar elikim as a shemayim v'saretz. Elikim, 
I think is used 32 times in Bereshis. Later, at the end of the story, it says, Eila told us Hashemayim Varetz B'yoyim HaSoyz Hashem Elikim. Yudke Vavke is introduced only at the end of the story. Why? So the Chazal say, in the beginning, Hashem wanted to create the world with Midas Hadin, and he saw it's not going to endure. Shitefi my Midas Arachamim. He put in Midas Arachamim. So the Balatanya explains, Midas Hadin is Gevura, that's Teva, nature. God is concealed in nature. You could see him, but you have to study and excavate and see the depth of nature. Midas Harachamim, says the Balatanya is, God introduced Chesed through, through what? So the expression in Tanya is, The revelation of godliness through Tzadikim and through the miracles of Torah. This is Midas Harachamim. This is Yud Kevavke, this is Chesed. Tzadikim, both their existence and how they live, and the Oysis of Moivsim in Torah and through Tzadikim, both is the Midas Harachimim, the Shema Chesed of Yud Kevavke that comes into the world and breaks the concealment of Midas Adin, the Tzimtzum, the Helam, the concealment, the restriction of Midas Agvur. They say from the Ruzhin and the Holy Ruzhin that was once sitting and he was telling stories of great Tzadikim. It was time to daven. So somebody said, somebody said, I don't remember the story accurately. I saw it a long time ago, but uh, something of this nature. Somebody said, maybe you'll do this after davening. So the Badich, the said, how does Halal open up? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed is Hashem. Yeah. Hallelujah, bless, praise, Avde Hashem, the servants of Hashem, and praise the name of Hashem. It says, Davening, you praise the name of Hashem. We're telling stories of Tzadikim, this is Hallelujah, Avde Hashem, we're praising the servants of Hashem, who are bottled to Hashem. First it says, Hallelujah, Avde Hashem, then it says, Hallelujah, Hashem, Hashem. So therefore it's very appropriate. So the Balatanya says that the Tzadikim reveal Shem Havayim, Midas Harachimim, in creation. Now, what does this mean? So he says what it means is the miracles that are melubash and teva. When rachamim becomes a partner with din, it doesn't just define nature, it imbues nature. Because the miracles beyond nature, that's chesed. Nature itself, nature itself is gvura. The miracles that are reflected through nature, this is rachamim, this is tiferes which synthesizes chesed and gvura. That there are miracles that don't break the laws of nature. On the contrary, nature itself bespeaks its truth. Let the door become wider. And that's a whole deeper element. That's where mayim al and mayim tachtoinim become synthesized without obliterating the parameters and the structure of either. You don't have to run away like koirach to mayim al or conversely to mayim tachtoinim. The ability to be able to remain in Mayim Tachtoinim, and yet it becomes a reflection of Mayim Elyonim. In other words, that the nature itself becomes a keli for that which is higher than Teva. Let's finish the last paragraph. Wow. Anybody, he says, who knows the story of what happened in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, after Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolshevik Revolution and Joseph Stalin and Mach Shemoy coming to power in 1924, knows that the fact that the Rebbe was liberated on Yud Beis Tammuz rather than being shot, rather than being sent to the Gulag for 25 years, like so many millions of people, the ability to literally save Yiddishkeit in the Soviet Union, he says it was a revealed miracle that was beyond nature. There was no explanation in nature. You're dealing here with not just a dictatorship. You're not just dealing with a tyrant. You're dealing here with one of the most evil men in the history of humanity. Somebody who sent close to 50 million of his own people to death. 
He created the man, greatest man-made hunger, I believe, probably the greatest man-made famine in history, or one of the greatest, because all the peasants in Ukraine and other places, they didn't want to conform to his new paradise on earth literally were starved to death volitionally. He took the produce and he sold it to other countries to be able to finance the industrial uh, progress in the former Soviet Union. You're dealing here with tyranny and evil and horrific torture and barbarity of a grand scale. Truth be told, most people don't even know the story of Russia. The Jews who come from Russia, many of them know it. Even they sometimes don't know the story, and I'll tell you why. Because by Stalin's funeral in 1953, millions of Russians were crying. The propaganda was so profound. The propaganda was so profound that Stalin's death was considered the death of your own mother. Your own father was the worst day in Russian history. Weeping, weeping. Little did these people know that their hell on earth came from this man who just died. So the propaganda, the brainwashing, the indoctrination. So the Rebbe says... What happened on Yud Beis Tam was that the Rebbe Rayats was freed and liberated from prison, from Stalinist, the Yevsekzi communist, Rishoyim, was a Nes Goloi Lamay It was an absolute miracle that was beyond nature. Nonetheless, it didn't happen through the sun stopping in the middle of the day or through the sea being split. It didn't negate Teva. It's not like Russia came down then. It took 70 years. It took... Uh, it took seven, almost 70 years from that day till communism fell. The seeds were planted, but nature was not defied. There was no bitl ateva, there was no obliteration of the laws of nature. Nature remained as is. Not only that, all of his enemies, all the opponents who wanted the Rebbe gone, remained in their position. It's not like God, you know, turned over Sadaim. There was a mobble and all the bad people were destroyed. That's not what happened. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. The regime remained the regime. The Evsexia remained the Evsexia. The Bolsheviks remained the Bolsheviks. Stalin remained Stalin. And the purgings of the subsequent years and decades came to ultimately testify to the fact that the Menagdim, the great opponents of Yiddishkeit and of the Jewish people, remained in their full strength. And yet, their very strength somehow was used to allow not only the Rebbe to live, but to be liberated and to continue building and growing the whole underground network of Yiddishkeit that affected hundreds of thousands of Jews in the Soviet Union. What does this represent? He says that moment, the mechitza, the wall between Alyoinim and Tachtoinim was removed. The left was subsumed in the right. This is where the synthesis happened. Sometimes you have a miracle and it destroys all of nature. That's the revelation of Mayim Malyoinim. There's no world, there's no Teva. Sometimes you have nature, nature by itself where godliness is concealed. Here you had those unique moments when something which was completely beyond nature, it was manifested through nature, the same government, the same Bolsheviks, the same powerful dictators who were the ones who arrested him, Apesha, Osar, Apesha, Hitler, they themselves had to use their very legal power in order to liberate him. He was not liberated because of a miracle of heaven. He was liberated because of the order of the very same communists who imprisoned him and tortured him and wanted him shot and exiled him. Those very same people were the ones who now became the conduit for his salvation. What is that about? This is where the Rebbeinah Shalolam synthesizes heaven and earth. This is where Mayim al and Mayim Tachtoinim come together, where Chesed and Gvura are not anymore living in two distinct realities, but this is the Midas HaRachamim, the Oysis of Moivsim of Shitefi Mai Midas HaRachamim, in which heaven and earth come together, the Mechitza that creates a separation of al and Tachtoinim is removed, not by running away to al or by becoming submerged in Tachtoinim, but by living in that space that transcends both and therefore can synthesize both. Such a moment was a moment that empowered afterwards every single Jew that we in our own lives can start telling this story where we could be mevatel, where we could nullify the wall 
between heaven and earth, which means practically between your involvement in the physical, material world, whatever you're involved in, which means voluntary things, and your involvement in Torah and mitzvahs, that mechitza is gone between the alyonim and the tachtonim, that even, even when you're involved in the world, you should have the light of the Torah and the mitzvahs. There shouldn't be a partition anymore. That even in Teva, you could see the Lamaila Mehat Teva. Even in Yabosha, you can walk through Yabosha like you're walking through the sea. Whatever I'm involved in, a person is going to a doctor's appointment, a person is doing taking care of his telephone bills or electric bills or gas bills or mortgage bills or tuition bills. A person is going to work or coming from work, a person is dealing with this issue, with that issue. This is not divinity. This is not infinity. It's not Torah and it's not mitzvahs. The ability to be able to see in every moment of life, even when I'm involved in the physical world, that it's really a conduit to be able to see in it the light of the divine, the light of Torah, the light of mitzvahs. That's the empowerment of the synthesis between Mayim al and Mayim Tachtoinim. Koirach's, Koirach wanted to be able, to, Koirach detached the lower from the higher because he felt the lower is much deeper than the higher. The problem is when you do that, it's premature and therefore what happens is you can get swallowed up by the earth. That's why it says when Mashiach comes, Kairach will be right. Allah will be like Mishamai. But you need the preparation before that of the bittel of Gvurat Chesed and the synthesis between them. This becomes the preparation. To the fulfillment of the prophecy in Yeshaya. The glory of Hashem will be revealed and all the flesh will see that God's mouth spoke. Ah. The Pasuk says, when Mashiach comes, the glory of Hashem will be revealed and all the flesh will see that God's mouth spoke. So literally, the Mepharshim say, what does it mean? It means that God's prophecies will be fulfilled so all the flesh will be able to see that God spoke. In other words, we'll see that what Hashem promised will be is materialized. But the Balatanya says something much deeper. And that is, Hashem listen to the, uh, the pshat. Literally, it means all people, all flesh will see that God's mouth spoke and it happens. It's real. The prophecies of the messianic era have been materialized. There's something much deeper here. Viro <laughs> means all the flesh, the physical flesh, the physical flesh of a person or of any living organism, of an animal, will see kifi Hashem Dibber. We'll see that the mouth of God speaks everything into existence. We'll be able to see the DNA of existence. Today you need a microscope to see the DNA, and even then you see the physical DNA. Our flesh will be able to perceive the inner spiritual divine energy, the consciousness that is in and behind all matter, that all matter is just a manifestation of divine consciousness. That's what's going to be. Even the basar, not just your mind, your spiritual mind or soul, even your basar, your physical flesh will be able to see elikus, be able to see elikus. The gashmi itself will be able to see elikus. And of course, as Kairach knew, one will even see that in some ways the shayrish of the gashmi is deeper than the shayrish of the ruchni. The shayrish of the is deeper than the shayrish of chesed. This happens through the miracles even beforehand, through the tzaddikim, who imbue into nature the revelation of godliness which is beyond nature. Just as it occurred by Yom Mahim. In those days, Bizman Hazed, this time, like we say, Hanukkah, Al Nisa Neris Al Atshuas the Nisim the Flesh of Shisla was saying about Yamim Mahaim Bizman Hazeh. So he says also about Yud Beis Tammuz. It was by Yamim Mahaim in those days. This is the 1920s when it happened. But Bizman Hazeh during this time of the year. So you had the synthesis of the Isis and Moivsim beyond Teva within Teva that gives every Jew the empowerment to be able not to see the world as a concealment and to see nature as divorced from the source, but rather to allow the full synthesis between the two experiences in our life, the moments of revelation and the moments of concealment, that within our concealment we can also open our eyes to be able to experience revelation there. What does this mean? It means that in a person's life, even a moment that seems so concealing, 
and so dark and there's the absence of meaning and purpose and harmony and serenity and wholesomeness instead of running away from it and just being frustrated by it and running either in Mayim to Mayim al or becoming buried in the despair and the quagmire of Mayim Tachtoinim, you could remain alert and you could remain focused and you could search for the light that is inside the Mayim Tachtoinim, for connecting it to the Mayim al to be able to bring together these two universes and these two worlds, which are really one when you have the Bittal, which Kairach did not have, the bittle that allows you to live in the empty space, which combines paradox. Let me see if there are uh, questions here. Okay, Zalmi asks a question, and that is, if when Mashiach comes, the separation between Mayim el and Mayim Tachtoinim will be gone, or the separation will still be intact? It's a great question, Zalmi. It's a great question. You want to know if the Mayim al and Mayim Tachtoinim will come back together or they will remain separate. Well, I think that's the whole point that we're learning. That when Mashiach comes, we're going to see the godliness in the Mayim Tachtoinim itself. And in a way, that's going to be even deeper than the Mayim al So they will become one, but not by becoming one in the sense that you have to obliterate the structure of one, but rather we'll be able to see the harmony and the true oneness that underlies everything. In other words, we'll be able to see that the Mayim al and Mayim Tachtoinim were never really separate. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? We're going to be able to see that the water that is above and the water that is below is never really separate. The separateness came from our own perception, from our own experience. But really we'll be able to see that the two were never really separate. That's what we're going to be able to see. That's what he's saying here. V'nigla k'vayd Hashem v'roh chalbasar yachtov k'pi Hashem diber will see that the separateness was never authentic. Or to quote the Balatanya in the story that I shared, we're going to see that, we're going to see that the door itself will become wider. So you don't have to walk through the wall because the door itself will become wider. Let me see if there are any more questions. Okay. Reb Levi Yitzhak of Bardichev was born 1740. He was a student of the Baal Shem Tev, later a student of the Magad. The Alter Rebbe was born 1745. He met the Baal Shem Tev at his Upshernish. Um, so this is a mistake. What you wrote, he did, the Baal Shem Tev cut the hair of the Balatanya. And uh, at about 18 years old, or 20 I think he became, he went to the Magad in the year Tafkov Chavdala, that would be 1764 or 65. So the Balatanya was then 19 or 20 years old, and he became the youngest and very beloved student of the Magad of Mizrich. Next question. Okay. You spoke about, you spoke about science and physics of nature expressing divinity. Scientific evidence is often a great deception because scientific research is paid and manufactured by corporations that will benefit. Rarely does an independent, unbiased, third party produce any scientific evidence. If the scientific evidence is so accurate, why are the conclusions and results constantly being disproved when new research is produced? You're led to believe that scientific evidence proves that something is true. It's a false assumption. Every day we hear new research shows old research to be false. That is true science. The bottom line is you will hear scientific evidence used when the medical community claims they know the cause of the disease. You will hear the medical doctors make statements of fact when it's really only opinions. You're being misled. You're being lied to. You're being deceived. Albert Einstein said, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition for mediocre minds. I love that. Great spirits have always encountered violent opposition for mediocre minds. David Eddy, professor of health policy at Duke said, only about 15% of all medical interventions are supported by solid scientific evidence. Eugene Robin, professor of Stanford University Medical School says, medical care is not a science and its practitioners are not scientists. Max Planck, father of quantum theory said, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents, but because its opponents die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Wow. They further a society that drifts from truth 
The further a society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. George Orwell. Okay, thank you for this early morning education about the biases that exist in the scientific community. Yes, I think all real intelligent people are aware of many of this. And science is a blessing. We, we, we appreciate science. We cherish science. But the definition of science is that we're using the tools that we have today, the instruments we have today, to be able to figure out things to the best of our ability, realizing that tomorrow or next year or in a decade or in a century, we may have to revamp everything. And that's why scientists, by definition, must be the most humble person in the world. That's what science really is. The moment science speaks in terms of absoluteness and cynicism and disdain, it's already not science. This is deep personal fears and agendas and and blind spots, etc. Next question. Will it be right to say that to say Kairach was mistaken, that the means is an end, and that was his mistake, he turns the means into an end, or perhaps the objective is to deal with the Gashmis and Simpson, but the tool to get there is through being connected to the Mayim el I struggle with it a lot when putting so much energy in my business. What is the means and what is the ends? Thank you very much. You're asking a good question. You're asking a good question. There is a secret here. Kairach wanted the Gashmias to be the end in and of itself. In some ways, he's right. Because the Shairish or Gashmias is deeper than Shairish or but it's a secret. And in order to get to that place, you have to see the Gashmias as a means to an end. Now you'll say, how could you have both? If you know the truth, that the Shairish or Gashmias is deeper than the Shairish or is. So how can you say the Gashmias should only be a means to an end? You could say... Now you have to make believe it's a means to an end. That's the paradox that requires Bittl. That's the paradox that requires Bittl. And you'll see this stated in the second section of Siv Zion. The second section of Siv Zion, how he applies this in Avoid. Don't we say in Tehillim that Hashem doesn't sleep? Why doesn't the Rebbe bring this Pasuk? Instead of the Pasuk, Asom Nafshainu Bachayim. There's a separate concept here. We're discussing the concept of making sure that the head and the feet remain synchronized. Is it correct to say that Kairach's mistake can be described as exchanging means and ends? Gvura is a means to the end of chesed, not an end in and of itself. Today, many live to work instead of work to live. Instead of working to live, you live to work. Your gvura is supposed to be a preparation for chesed. That's true. That's true. Gvur is a means for a deeper chesed. And mayim tachtoinim is a means for a deeper mayim al And b'chol d'rochecha de'eyu must have the idea of kol ma'asecha l'shem shamayim. In other words, that it's a means for an end. My, my, my business and my work, I put work in it. But the means is taira, mitzvahs, ruchnis. The truth is, when Mashiach comes, we're going to see something new. We're going to see that the dichotomy never really existed. On the contrary, the Gashmi is deeper than the Ruchni, but in order to get to that space, you have to be able to go through this space and you have to be able to have the bittle of operating on two levels of consciousness. Where did Kairach learn all this? Who was his father? His father's name was Yitzar. You could look in the parsha. Vaikach Kairach ben Yitzar ben Kahaz ben Levi. Did Kairach grab the second day because he was a second child? Maybe. <laughs> Okay, Chevra, my love and blessings to all of you for a beautiful day and a meaningful day and a beautiful and inspiring Shabbos. Just to remind you, Be'ezer Hashem, tonight, 8.30 p.m., we will have another shear in Lekutei Sichis Parshas Bolok. That's going to be 8.30. Everybody is invited. Also in the after, on, on the yeshiva.net in the afternoon, there will also be a shear in Ivrit, in Hebrew, that will be up, that will be going on Kikar HaShabbat in... Uh, the website in Israel. In the meantime, I wish you a beautiful, inspiring, meaningful, uplifting, and unifying day. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. 
make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.